This is Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Subscribe for new content notifications. Now, here's Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter at Backup Bradley Above and everything that we're talking about here today. Lots to unpack today. Okay, we're going to talk about this. This is from the top down. Okay, now we've noticed a trend here on the channel in following every development that we can when it comes to crypto, blockchain, digital assets in general. And what we have seen is a narrative that is created from the international committees and bodies like the G20, the Financial Stability Board, regulatory agency connected to the G20, or the FATF, right, the Financial Action Task Force connected to the G20, and other organizations as well. And then we see, just like we saw with the FATF when they came out with the uh, guidelines or recommendations to go K KYC AML, we saw that was adopted within a day or two from the United States uh, Secretary of Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, and he adopted that recommendation and made it a a policy basically here for exchanges and that would be a part of the framework here for cryptocurrency exchanges and the like so i think we're going to show you some things today that really show us that we are about to get a global stable coin or global stable coins it could be plural and we're going to look at some uh, information. We covered the Financial Stability Board, again, regulatory agency connected to the G20, about supervisory challenges, framework for global stablecoin back in April. It was the first time we heard those two words strung together in a sentence ever in the three years in this space. And it really speaks pretty greatly to the idea when we move through this material i don't know how you can move through the material we're going to look at today and not come away thinking that this is about xrp and the xrp ledger and possibly even a stable coin developed off the xrp uh token itself one or the other so let's go ahead and do this and let's look at the narrative leading up to it so let's start right here today at this spot right here shout out to spiro made a nice little two minute video here about the banking digital arms race is here and he is absolutely right we are in the cusp of a transition that will forever change the game i hope you're already all are paying attention full report and listen this is that famous picture of a year or two ago with Brad Goldinghouse sitting in a room with so many other heavies from the IMF, Christine Lagarde at the time, uh, and S Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority. I mean, Hong Kong Monetary Authority. I mean, what other token or representative company of a digital asset that's being used is in that room? Oh, that's right. None. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Brad Goldinghouse and Ripple. Swell starts tomorrow. So that's exciting too. know that we'll be uh, following that as much as possible and let you know of any developments that come out of swell. Hopefully we'll get an announcement or two, but I'll play this video at the end. If I get enough time, Spiro, it's a great video. I want to thank you for sending it to me. And if I get time, I'll play it there. And if not, maybe I'll do it tomorrow morning, but let's see how much time we got. Let's get into this. A reminder. I just covered the Spunta project from all Italian banks now being on the quarter platform, R3, huge news, and the blockchain banking industry in Italy. Want to learn more? Come on in and register for QuarterCon. That's coming up October 20th through the 22nd. Shout out to David Rudder and everybody at R3 and every bank in Italy for getting on that quarter platform. If you don't know, the quarter platform, once you're on it, has the access to settle your payments through the quarter settler, which uses currently right now one digital asset for settlement at this time. It's XRP. Okay, moving along, even more news hinting to what I'm talking about from the top down. Steve Mnuchin, U.S. Treasury Secretary, the G7 finance ministers and central bank governors issued a statement on digital payments. Come on in. Now, 
I'm not going to read that to you. I will go through it because I'm just pointing to the fact that they just got done with the conference for the G7. There's another comment he made here, productive video conference with G7 finance ministers and central bank governors, IMF, WB, and FSB, Financial Stability Board, to discuss the response to the pandemic and strategies to achieve a robust global recovery. Also discussed broader debt and digital payment issues. You got to look into it, right? Here it is. Here it comes. And by the way, shout out to Aaron Cole. Look at this. Blink Pay, Digital Business.crypto, Healthcare.crypto is amazing. And Money Zoom. I love it. Those are some of his dot cryptos for Unstoppable Domains. Link in the description. Shout out to you, Aaron Cole. That's really good stuff. I just saw that. Now, moving on to build on this international development and this international um, coalition and conversation and consortium for all of this digital payments protocols and things like that. Because we're about to look at some pretty powerful information from the financial stability board so hang in there get yourself something to drink head for the bank of of the bank of international settlements augustine carstens said libra along with bitcoin and other financial innovations is a wake-up call for central banks to think more about modern payment systems well he couldn't be more right because we're going to look at it. Financial Stability Board has a map here, and they are talking about a roadmap to enhance cross-border payments. <coughs> Excuse me. This is October 13th today. It just came out, and I think that report will come out tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. But at any rate, what we're going to look at today, because I mean, there's so much to look at here, I encourage you all to go look at it. And we are going to look at this which is going to talk about the delivery roadmap to enhance cross-border payments. Let's talk about these four points right here really quickly. So committing to a joint and public and private sector vision to enhance cross-border payments. Somebody get Jerome Powell on the phone and tell him, looks like we're going to have private sector after all, Jerome. Coordinating on uh, regulatory supervisory and oversight frameworks, improving existing payment infrastructures, maybe new protocol like the ILP and the XRP ledger, and arrangements to support the requirements of the cross-border payments market. Yes. We got to remember we're in many different jurisdictions. You know, there's a lot to all of this. Increasing data qui uh, quality and straight through processing. Increasing data quality and straight through processing. Do you mean like the rule that was made effective in July by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau about being able to see the straight through path to the payment and the transparency of what the payment will cost for the sender and receiver before they actually accept the payment for banks and credit unions? You mean that kind of straight through processing? All right. So, and then exploring the potential role of new payment infrastructures and arrangements. New payment infrastructure, say it isn't so. Matter of fact, say it is so, because that's what we want to hear. So the reality is, is I think we're about to see something very cool going into the future in the coming weeks and months. I really, really do. I have made no bones about the fact that I believe RippleNet and I believe the XRP ledger and the ILP could be deemed public good or and or systemically important to the financial system. If they're really going to use these new payment infrastructures like the ledger, I believe that they would have to have a special designation to keep them to a heightened prudential, not only for security, but to be held to a certain standard because they are going to be a universal protocol for the world to use for payments in the Internet of Value. Just my thought on the matter. Matter. But let's hear a little more about what the Financial Stability Board says, because now we're going to go into the regulation, supervision and oversight of global stable coin arrangements. Huh. OK, like I said, we covered this back in uh, in April when it originally came out and we saw it. Let's go now to page four for a second here. Now, by the way, um, this is an amazing document. Every single page. I wish I could bring it to you, but I know there'd be 10 people watch if I did the whole page, the whole PDF. So I will provide this for everybody to see. You will see it has stabilization me mechanisms. It has all the different outlines here. Let's keep moving. Because what I want to get to is the 10 points 
that it gives one second here uh Page four, here it is, the 10 points. The Financial Stability Board high-level recommendations to address the regulatory supervisory and oversight challenges raised by global stable coins arrangements. So authorities should have and utilize the necessary powers and tools and adequate resources to comprehensively regulate, supervise, and oversee a global stable coin arrangement and its associated functions and activities and enforce relevant laws and regulations effectively. Authorities should apply comprehensive regulatory supervisory and oversight requirements, relevant international standards, and GSC arrangements on a functional basis and proportionately to their risk. Authorities should cooperate and coordinate with each other, both domestically and internationally to foster efficient and effective communication and consultation in order to support each other in fulfilling their respective mandates and to ensure comprehensive regulation, supervision, and oversight of a global stablecoin arrangement across borders and sectors. Now, I want you to stop for a second. Why are they putting these things in place? Because we're getting ready to get one, at least one. Right. Maybe it's more than one, but we're going to get at least one because they put all these recommendations and rules and supervisory conditions and address all these different jurisdictions and cross border sectors and all these things. So we could not have it. Yeah, it's exactly right. You don't see any rules here for a football bat because there isn't one. Nobody uses a football bat because they don't exist. But they're going to use a global stable coin because we're getting ready to get it. <laughs> yeah, I happen to think the XRP is leaning in hard on that as a solution. We shall see. You know, maybe it's a stable coin off of that asset. Authorities should ensure the arrangements and have in place comprehensive governance framework with a clear allocation of accountability for the functions and activities within the global stablecoin arrangement. Again, we've talked about this, and this is why I believe the rest of the world has not gone ahead with the use of XRP yet. Oh, but Singapore is way further ahead than the U.S. The U.S. is way behind. The U.K. is much further ahead. This country is much further ahead. That's all true. And you know what else is true? They haven't started using XRP yet, have they? Because that's true, too. Well, there's a reason for it, and I think it comes from the top down. And I think what you're seeing here is a little peep into the window or back into the kitchen, and we're seeing how the secret sauce gets made. Let's keep going here. I'm going to skip a couple. Authorities should ensure the GSC arrangements have in place robust systems for collecting, storing, and safeguarding data. Authorities should ensure the GSC arrangements have appropriate recovery and resolution plans. Authorities should ensure that the GSC arrangement provides users and relevant stakeholders with comprehensive and transparent information necessary to understand the functioning of the GSC arrangement, including the respect to its state stabilization mechanism. Now that is important too, because what we're talking about here is a global stable coin that is so reliable. It is so reliable in its value that they world, the world would choose to use this asset for payments around the world for what they're doing. And even in some cases, countries would adopt it as their currency even. For the lack of government strength or, or the ability to support a currency in that particular country. And that coin being so reliable in its value that they could use it anywhere for anything at any time over any other choice of payment or asset to make. So now that is very important. Let's move to page seven here. Skipping over a ton of stuff, ladies and gentlemen. And here we have page seven. All right. Systemic risk, where is this? You know, I'll tell you, I've read most of this, not all of it, but most of it. And shout out to Big Skinny who sent this to me. But I know that there was others that have been kicking these uh, documents up too. So shout out to David uh, as well. I think he actually threw this out too, you know, so I just want to give everybody the proper credit for that. So let me see here. Da -da -da -da. Page seven. Yes. Okay. So here we talk about systemic risk to the financial stability, right? Okay. And it talks about here, no existing operational stable coins or other crypto assets currently appear to have reached a scale that could pose financial stability risk 
But you know what? That's the challenge that they need to look at because it says right here, while so-called global stable coins have the potential to contribute to developing new global payment arrangements. Wow. Who's been working on new global payment arrangements? I think it's Ripple with XRP, if I'm not mistaken. They could present a host of challenges to the regulatory supervisory oversight and enforcement authorities. This is because such instruments may have the potential to pose systemic risk to the financial system and significant risk to the real economy, including through the substitution of domestic currencies. Is anybody? Hello? What? Get your dirty socks off the coffee table. Are you hearing this? What did we just see back in August? We saw the IMF suggest that the FSOC in the U.S. should designate RippleNet as systemically important financial market utility. Uh-huh. Because a global stablecoin could rise to the level of becoming a systemic risk to the financial uh, system. Or, in other words, the real economy. The reality here is such that this is why I believe XRP will be held to a heightened potential, and it's not just another digital asset. It is going to become a digital asset that is a part of the framework of this entire digital asset space, if not just all the money or the Internet of value. OK, now let me skip past that. Keep this moving here because I want to try to keep this tight. Look at this. All right. So. For by the G20 to enhance cross-border payments, authorities are exploring the potential role of a new payment infrastructures and part of this concur that appropriate risk management within the global stable coins and sound legal underpinnings as a basis for the use of stable coins in multiple jurisdictions constitute one important building block. I got to tell you, the world is going to be getting at least one global stable coin, according to the G20 and the Financial Sta uh, Stability Committee uh, Board, ladies and gentlemen. I can tell you that much right now. Now, I'm skipping a lot of great stuff. Let me keep going here. Man, I wish we had more time. <laughs> Transfer of coins operating the infrastructure, a DLT protocol determining roles in access to the system. Access may be permission. Access, including the ability to hold and transfer stable coins, is controlled with defined access and conditions or permissionless. Anyone can access the transfer the uh, and transfer the stable coins peer to peer directly to other wallets. Now, this sounds a lot like to me like the conversation we heard David Schwartz talk about before last year swell that you can build and launch stable coins off of the xrp ledger come on in now let me take you one more place here before we wrap this up because i'm not i don't i can't go through all 70 some pages of this today but let's just take a look at this so okay all right, so page 13, it should be 2.1 here. It talks about this. Potential risk to financial stability from a global stable coin could pose financial stability risk through certain key channels. If a global stable coin were widely used in a common store of value, even a moderate variation in its value might cause significant fluctuations in users' wealth. You hearing this? They are addressing the fact that what I've been talking about, that there needs to be some kind of a price set or a guaranteed reliable price floor to that asset. Such wealth effects may, may be sizable enough to affect spending decisions and economic activity. Wealth effects uh, may be particularly pronounced in a in EMDEs, which I take as smaller countries where the likelihood of a GSC becoming more mainstream store of value may be higher than in advanced economies. If widely used for payments, any operational disruption in the global stablecoin arrangement might have significant impacts on economic activity and financial system functioning. If users relied upon stablecoin to make regular payments, significant operational disruptions could quickly affect real economic activity. By blocking remittances and other payments, large-scale flows of funds into or out of the GSC 
uh, could test the ability of the supporting infrastructure to handle high transaction volumes and the financing conditions of the wider financial system. What they're saying here is they can't have many people get in and participate to this and then all of a sudden shut it off and say, you know what? We're not going to allow you to do this through these corridors here. Oh, no. What we're talking about is global adoption of the regulatory framework of the asset itself and the jurisdictions and the governance and compliance all being built into it because everyone is going to be able to rely on the value of this token. We cannot have it fluctuate in value, which is why we may see a stable coin developed off the XRP asset. We'll see. Exposure of the financial institutions might increase in scale and change in nature, nature, particularly if the financial institutions played multiple roles within the GSC arrangements, for example, as resellers, wallet providers, managers, custodians, trustees, and reserve assets. This may be a source of market credit or operational risk to those institutions and eventually may end up having systemic implications. The large-scale use of GSCs uh, might magnify confidence effects. A greater sensitivity to confidence effects could also affect the extent of the use of a GSC uh, as a store of value and or means of payment. Moreover, closer linkages to financial institutions might also expose a GSC to adverse confidence effects, such as when a financial institution that acts as a reseller market maker of the GSC arrangement comes under financial distress. The reverse may also be true for the potential failure of a GSC might expose the financial institution involved in a GSC arrangement to adverse confidence effects. Just dealing with, you know, if this if this back end of this goes down from a financial institution or if the GSC for some reason has trouble itself, these could all be systemic in how it could affect the real economy. These channels may also interact. For example, disruption to payments may cause further decline in confidence, which in turn could promote further redemption and decline in the GSC's value, compounding, we compounding wealth effects. Excuse me. The significance of these channels and their impact on financial stability depend on how widely and for what purpose a GSC is used and whether linkages to the financial system increase. For example, if a GSC were adopted as a widespread means of payment, but not as a store of value, its potential implication for financial stability may be narrower. If, however, a GSC also became adopted as a significant store of value by some of its users, other channels, including those pertaining to confidence effects, interlinkages to financial institutions and macroeconomic stability may become more prominent. There you go. Guys, I'm going to wrap it right there and just tell you that, listen, the G20 and the FSB have been working on I mean, a long time now for global stablecoin arrangements. And this is just out. This is just out. And this is the third phase out of a three-phase uh, reporting uh, path here that they've been on. And I tell you, you know, I truly believe that we have been waiting for some international clarity and adoption in this regard and i think we just took one step closer to that today and i think because of that you will also see the united states and other domestic areas around the world uh in those respective regions begin to get that clarity as well because that is where it comes from from the top down that's going to do it for me ladies and gentlemen listen don't just click on anything on the internet because you never know where it'll take you i've got the trusted vetted links for anything that you may want or need whether it's a ledger nano s currently a uh almost 40 dollars savings on a family pack right there for ledger nanos or get an unstoppable domains get that dot crypto name and i'll help you sell it here online on the show and all the other things that you can find in there that are really great make sure you check them out before you go hit the like and subscribe and leave a comment below i definitely want to get your thoughts on this and share with somebody you know and keep a lookout sometime over the weekend here i just did an amazing straight fire interview with mickey b fresh and it's on the uh line of credit from ripple with xrp and it is also touching on a recent flare announcement as well so keep an eye out for that i'll catch all of you on the next one